Well, Jonah, which I preached on a couple of weeks ago, has more than one sermon in it. Such a great story. It's been said that the Bible is true, and some of it even happened. The Bible is true, and some of it even happened. Now, having just said that, in certain Baptist churches, I would soon be fired at the end of the sermon. Because some believe that unless you take the Bible literally, uh, unless you believe that Jonah was actually swallowed by a big fish, unless you believe that, unless you believe that, you can only be faithful. But there's power in stories that are symbolic, right? People tell us stories all the time, and there's truth in the stories. So whether you believe that Jonah was literally swallowed by a whale, or whether you believe that it's a symbolic story full of truth, there's something waiting for us in this great tale, particularly the whale's tale. So Barbara began the story by saying that Jonah was called by God to go to the Ninevites, and the Ninevites were the enemy. And Jonah hated the Ninevites because the Ninevites had conquered his people time and time again. They were the big kid on the block. And God called Jonah to speak a word of challenge to the Ninevites, and, God, and Jonah knew the heart of God and knew that God, if given a chance, would forgive the Ninevites, which is what happened in the end. And Jonah didn't want the Ninevites to be forgiven. He wanted them to be destroyed. And it says elsewhere in the story that there were over 100,000 men, women, and children in Nineveh. And Jonah hated every one of them. Can you imagine wanting to see an entire people destroyed? So Jonah gets on a boat to go in the opposite direction because he doesn't want to forgive the Ninevites. And as Barbara said, there's a big storm because God's not going to let Jonah get away. The sailors reluctantly throw, them, throw him into the sea. The waters calm, and a big fish comes. Could be a salmon, could be a cod, could be a whale, and swallows Jonah. And we pick up the story here. Chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 17 tells us that the whale swallows him. But it's important to note that God doesn't allow Jonah to drown. God rescues Jonah in the form of a whale because God has a plan for Jonah. Even though Jonah might be the last one that we would expect God to choose to bring forgiveness because he has such a hard heart towards the Ninevites, God sees something in Jonah that Jonah doesn't see in himself and that we don't see in Jonah. God chooses Jonah, an unlikely one, the one who hates the Ninevites the most to go and bring a word, an opportunity for reconciliation. This is a reoccurring theme throughout the Bible. God chooses the unlikely ones like Jonah to bring about that which is pleasing to God. God chooses unlikely people to bring healing and hope. So if God could see something good in Jonah, then why not you and me? Do you remember uh, an animated movie that was always on at, at Christmas time, maybe still is. It's called Babes in Toyland. Anybody remembers that? Babes in Toyland. Probably still show it every year. Do they still show it, Lisa? Maybe, maybe. It's about all the broken toys, all the misfit toys, all the toys with broken cranks, the wind-up toys, and those where the stuffing falls out of the stuffed bears. All the broken toys are sent to the land, the island of misfits. And there they are welcomed 
and there they find a home. It's a really sweet, sweet movie that no one is left out, no one is excluded. No matter how often we feel like the outsider, we are welcomed, and in being welcomed, we are restored to health. Again and again in the Bible, there's this theme of the misfits being chosen by God to bring about that which is pleasing to God. So if God can see something good in Jonah, then how about me? Or how about you? Think about all the characters in the Bible. Think about Moses, a murderer, and on top of that, he couldn't string a sentence together because he had a pronounced stutter. He is chosen by God to go and speak a word to the Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses says, me? Think of Abraham and Sarah in their old, old age, chosen by God to give birth to a son from whom a mighty nation will come. That child will be known as Isaac, and from Isaac in time will come the people of Israel. Imagine choosing this old couple. Or Jeremiah the prophet who said, I'm just a kid, I'm just 16 years old, and you want me to go and speak truth to the empire, to my own king? We think of Ruth, who was an immigrant, who was a refugee, an outsider. Think about it in the context of what's going on in our nation and in our world today. Ruth has chosen this Moabite woman to bring a word of hope and healing to the people of Israel, this outsider, to bring a blessing. God looks at the land of misfit toys, sees all the imperfect people, and sees worth and beauty and hope and strength. Richard Bach, the writer, says, argue for your limitations long enough, and sure enough, they're yours. We argue for our limitations all the time, don't we? You know, oh, not me. I mean, why can't you send somebody with more gifts or more talent? You feel God nudging you in a certain direction, and we argue for our limitations. But again, God always sees our potential. And the invitation in God choosing someone like Jonah, this hard-hearted guy, that we are invited to see Jonah through God's eyes, and we're invited to see each other through God's eyes and to stop arguing for our limitations and to do what God would have us do and become. So Jonah gets swallowed by a big fish. Salmon, cod, whale, take your pick. And Jonah is smart enough to see that he has another chance. Even though he tried to run away from God, even though he hated the Ninevites who he was afraid God would forgive, which indeed he did do later on in, in the story, Jonah is smart enough when he is in the belly of the fish to recognize that he has a second chance and to recognize that God has granted him that second chance to do what the Creator would have him do and become. And so we pick this up in chapter 2, verse 2. I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol, and Sheol is hell. That's as deep as you can go. And God heard my voice. Verse 3, you cast me into the depths of the heart of the sea. Verse 5, the waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. Can you visualize that? Brian, do you see that? The weeds wrapped around the head? Yeah. I went down to the land whose bars closed over me forever. Seemingly all is lost for Jonah. But Jonah is still praying, even in the belly of the whale. Have you ever felt lost? Ever felt like you're, you're in the belly of the whale? Ever feel like it's just darkness around you and you don't see the way forward? As if there is no hope, but still you pray? That's what Jonah's doing. He's in the belly of the whale. He knows it's not over. It should be over, but he's scared and he doesn't know what's going to happen. And so he prays with this beautiful poetic imagery. Anybody here ever been a patient in the hospital? Yeah, it's no fun, is it? No fun. So I'm, uh, I've mentioned this before, but it's just this part of my story that, that has helped to shape me. And I went in for surgery at about, about 11 years ago. I had prostate cancer, had surgery. 
and it didn't go according to plan. And I was waiting for my system to wake up. Your internal system has to wake up before they release you to the hospital. I won't go into detail by what I mean for your system to wake up, but they won't release you from the hospital. And the doctor says, well, sometimes this happens, and it, usually within two days, your system, your body will begin to function again, and you can go home. Four days later, I'm still at the hospital. My system has not woken up. I'm in a great deal of distress. And I'm walking at 3 in the morning with that IV pole, with that, wearing the, that gown that they make you wear, where you don't know whether to tie it in the front or the back, right? I mean, there are no instructions with this thing. And I'm walking around feeling miserable at 3 in the morning, walking around the nurse's station, up and down the aisle. And I'm wondering if I'll ever get out of there feeling like I'm in the belly of the whale. And at three in the morning, all I can see is the darkness. That's the prayer of Jonah. And I was praying, and we pray when we're in the hospital, right? When things are tough. Verse six, Jonah says to God, I'm in the whale, seaweed wrapped around my head. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Verse 7, as my life was ebbing away, I remember the Lord and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Verse 9, and deliverance belongs to the Lord. I know this moment of darkness, says Jonah in his prayer, is not going to be the final word. I trust that you are going to carry me and accompany me. I don't know what the future holds. All I see is darkness and all the gunk and being in a whale's belly, can you imagine? And all the smells. But deliverance belongs to you, my Lord. So back to the hospital. Me in my hospital gown. So in the fourth, the morning of the fourth day, about six in the morning, I call my friend Dan, who had had the same surgery the year before. And I had been talking to him. He had been coaching me. And things were not going according to plan. And I said with all sincerity, Dan, am I ever going to get out of here? And Dan said to me, you're going to be okay. I promise you it will get better. A couple hours later, my system woke up. Would you like details? No. My system woke up. Everybody on the floor knew it. I was happy. I was getting out of there. Life was going to be good. Eleven years later, here I am. But I knew I was in the belly of the whale. But even though it felt scary and dark to me, the words of my buddy Dan said, it's going to be okay. There's going to be light. There's going to be hope. And then that great verse, the last verse, verse 10, the whale spewed, which is a polite word, spewed Jonah, smelly, covered with gunk, seaweed around his head, up on the beach because Jonah had work to do. Jonah's work was to go to the Ninevites, go to the ones that he hated, and offer a word of healing and hope, which the Ninevites claimed, and they were saved. But Jonah wouldn't have gotten there unless God had saved Jonah from drowning, unless Jonah was able to claim something within himself that in the midst of the darkness to know that it was God that had saved him and rescued him and would be faithful to him. God sees our potential always. We argue for our limitations in ourselves and in others, but God always sees what we're capable of in our strength and our beauty. And we are invited to see ourselves through God's eyes because if God can use someone like Jonah, hard-hearted and hard-headed, then how about you and me to bring about healing and hope in a way that is pleasing to God? So I'd like to close with a 
little quote by Frederick Buechner. Frederick Buechner is a pastor in Vermont, now well into his 80s, has a little house up on a mountaintop outside of Burlington. He's a great theologian. This is what he said about the story of Jonah. No matter how deep it dove and no matter how dark the inside of its belly, no depth or darkness was enough to drown out the sound of Jonah's prayer. I am cast out of thy presence, said Jonah. How shall I again look upon the holy temple? And then Beekner says, the intractable and waterlogged old man called out from six fathoms and God heard him. And God hears us. And Beekner says, and answered him, and Jonah's relief at being delivered from the whale can hardly have been greater than the whales at being delivered from Jonah. Spewed him up on the beach. Because Jonah had a work, a job to do. In spite of himself, he heeded the nudge of God and offered a word of healing and hope. If God could see something in Jonah, why not you? How about me? This is the good news. Thanks be to God, and may God's people say it.